This is Booking It to Financial Freedom, show number 23. I think a lot of us feel that we need to do things on our own, but the whole point in Who Not How is you have to collaborate and have mm-hmm. people do what they're best at. Otherwise, you can't reach your full potential. You're never going to continue to grow if you're taking on you know, a majority of the tasks yourself. Some of the highest achievers, they cannot delegate at all you know they have to take on the task because they have to be in control and that's counterproductive to growth you're not the smartest person in the room part of being successful is understanding that you have to find the smartest people yes this book is about trying to find who's and people that can assist you but in turn you have to realize that you are going to be who's for people as well so it's a symbiotic relationship Mm -hmm. welcome to booking it to financial freedom where we explore literature from some of the most successful experts in their field to help you build a blueprint for personal growth and financial freedom. Join us as we examine a new book every month and break down key concepts to help you get out of the rat race and on track to start building a life better than you ever imagined. Hey everyone, I'm your host, Amanda Schneider, realtor and investor, and I'm here with my co-host and teammate, Jamie Booth. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Amanda. How's it going? Good. How are you? Uh, I am doing pretty good. I'm yep. enjoying the uh, warm weather. Yeah. Um, but we're having like record rainfalls here in Colorado, so it's been pretty crazy. was trying to get a few chores done yesterday, and mm-hmm. what well, was the day before yesterday, and a lightning storm that rolled in. It was just crazy. I had a lightning strike like maybe 100 meters away, 100 yards oh, away from me. Well, that's scary. Was, yeah, you didn't was, have like a metal tool in your hand or anything? You no, have? thankfully I was in the Jeep at that oh, point. Oh, okay. okay. Wow. <laughs> Wasn't outside, but I yeah. was trying to get some things done and it was just raining. I mean, cats and dogs. Yeah. People who don't live in Colorado are probably like, why do they open every episode talking about the weather? But we have- <laughs> It's been unusual. It's been unusual the okay, last yeah. month or two. Or we're just getting old. Maybe. Yeah, possible. <laughs> well, no, normally, I mean, it's normal for us to like have a random snow fall in June. Yeah. But not to have this much rain, so no. it's good because everything's green. No, I think we're busting a lot of records. I think we've already eclipsed our annual rainfall mm-hmm. in totals. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's been pretty crazy. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. Um. So this is our last episode for Who Not How, as yeah. far as um, summarizing the book, and then our our very last one is we're gonna have a guest on. But you and I were kind of chatting as we were preparing uh, to, you know, just preparing for this episode that we were reading some kind of mixed reviews about the book, which yeah. I found interesting and I somewhat agree with, but you were saying that you had read, somebody was saying that it, it could have been condensed and basically like, yeah, that. I mean, so for, you know, anybody listening or even really cares or is curious, mm-hmm. like generally I'll listen to like the chapter, like the audio book chapter is like right before we do the episodes to kind of refresh it. I yeah. try to read the book and then do a refresher beforehand. And I, I got through, you know, the chapters we're going to cover this today, this morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'll just Google or YouTube some stuff um, to see if there's any, you know, people had learned any points that, you know, stuck out to them that, you know, may not have resonated to me, but might be valuable to other people. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I ran across this one review. It was like, this book was mediocre at best. Um, it, it, it should have been more of a, like an article instead of yeah. a book. Like yeah. it was, it was unnecessary that, right. that it was this long. And I was like, eh, I, and, get, I can see that. And I just find that funny. I mean, we're not, you know, our podcast isn't to rate books or anything no. like that. To, and we're obviously picking ones that we think are helpful, yeah. but I actually really liked the book. I thought it was valuable. Like, yeah. I get um, what they're saying because yes, it's a simple concept, you know, find people to help you basically, but you can't drive home that point unless you're giving lots of examples, lots of examples. understanding how to use it. So. I like the quotes too. Like I'm a yeah. quote person and I love it when they, you know, validate points that they're making with quotes from people, mm-hmm. you know, in the past, you know, hundred, you know, hundreds of years ago or even recently, but I like the quotes. I like the stories. I like yeah. the reinforcement. And, you know, to be honest, a lot of the, a lot of these books are kind of like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of them are just, you know, a simple concept that's drawn out and reinforced right. by different facts and all that yeah. stuff. So I like it. And then another thing I was complaining about, if anybody's reading this book or listening to it on audio, like the, uh, my one complaint was the, the narrator who is also the author, yeah. I believe I could be wrong, but I'm pretty positive. Is like his uh his he's not the best narrator. His sure. voice is a little monotone, so like you're listening to it and certain points that may have stuck out on my mind if I were reading it in print weren't really resonating me yes. to me in my brain as he was reading it. So that's kind of my only complaint with the audiobook. But yeah. Other than that, I've I've really enjoyed covering this book. 
reading it. It's good, and it's a new. It was new to me too. I think this is the first book mm-hmm. that we've covered in the podcast that is neither one of was, us had read. Neither first, one of us had yeah. read before, so I I like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and my tip to anyone who, because I also listen to the audio version, is if you don't really like the narrator, you feel like they're kind of slow and not super engaging is listen to it on 1.5 to two times the speed and it makes it sound much more engaging yeah so, yeah 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 and uh kind of, we were kind of giggling about this before we started uh recording like he needed a who right he needed yeah, a, he, need a who. he needed a he narrator needed, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he did it himself it's funny uh one thing i do really like in the book that i wanted to bring up it's actually the conclusion of the book and it's the story of dan who is um, he's the founder of Strategic Coach. So he's the reason that Ben wrote this book. Um, so Dan and Babs is his wife. And they tell the story of how they met and then formed Strategic Coach. And mm-hmm. I just thought it was a great example of how two like-minded people, two who's can come together to, you know, start a successful business and be a who for each other. Right. And it doesn't have to be a husband and wife. In this case, it is. But it can really just be two people that have, you know, like minds but are strong in different areas and they come together. So I just thought that was kind of a neat story. He talks about how uh, Dan actually went bankrupt in the late 70s and got a divorce. So, like, his life kind of seemed like it was going downhill. Yeah. And then he meets Babs, and she was a massage therapist running her own business. And he started to teach her some of the principles that he was developing of this, strate- which became strategic coach. Um, and she just thought they were so wonderful that she quit her job or sold her business as a massage therapist and wanted to help him grow this idea of strategic coach. And that's where it came today where they, you know, coach hundreds of thousands of uh, entrepreneurs. Yeah. There was a few different things that really stuck out to me in the story. And one was when he divorced, when he had his failed marriage before he told himself he was going to get, I can't remember how you phrased it. It was like, I'm going to, He's basically looking to get married but never get divorced again or something like that. Yeah. It was something mm-hmm. how he – and then a couple of the other concepts that he put together prior to getting remarried is he basically made kind of a list of yes. of, of what he was looking for. Mm-hmm. And that resonated to me through some of the Tony Robbins concepts with uh, in relationships is like if you want to find the right person, you got to make a list of what, what it is, and then you have to become the person – that would attract that type of person. So in this case, when, when he met his wife, they literally were just like, you know, uh, you know, yin and yang, well, yes. not really yin and yang. They were opposites, but they were just like perfectly right. fit for each other. There mm-hmm. was no conflict. They worked well together. They didn't have to, he said that one of those, uh, um, requirements was that there were, there was not going to be no contest in the relationship. So they just really meshed really well together. And then as far as the business side of it, he kind of, um, he related to how they ran things to like, she ran the theater or whatever, like she ran the theater and he was operating behind the scenes yeah. and together they made, you know, the put on the entire production. Yes. So yeah. it was, it was some, some pretty neat little things out of that little story when it wasn't, wasn't very long either. Yeah. And he says uh, what you were saying, he said for the next 25 years, he maintained a, what I want journal. And in that he wrote everything, you know, business relationships, but that's how he knew when he met Babs, cause he had already, defined what he wanted in in a in a partner and there she was and then the other thing i thought was really funny again not a whole lot of value but i just chuckled at it when i heard it he met her at a seminar Mm -hmm. or something like he came late and uh he went in to sit in the seminar or whatever it was it was like a maybe it was a training event i can't remember exactly what it was but there was only one seat left and it was next Next to her her. yeah and he goes to sit down and he saw her he's like i think she's redhead right i think he said he saw like a really you know attractive tall redhead Mm -hmm. And he was kind of gawking at her, like, obviously. And she's yeah. like, uh, you like what you see? And he's like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds super cheesy, but obviously it worked for them. Yeah, they so. said it wasn't like any, any kind of conflict or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. It just like hit it off immediately. I, I thought it, I got a little chuckle out of that. Yeah, that's a great story. But it, it the, the, the listing every day, what you want, really resonated with me. I think it goes back to the um, Miracle Morning to, you know, keeping that journal and maybe not knowing what to write. That's something you could start to do is just every day what you what you want out of life mm-hmm. and keep reminding yourself every day. So I'm going to try that. Um, okay, we are going to continue where we left off last time. So we were in part three where we were talking about freedom of relationships, and we're going to start in chapter eight. So this one is how to avoid the wrong who's, even the highly attractive ones. Yeah, and I think this is actually a pretty valuable lesson because I it would be very easy – 
to succumb to, you know, the, you know, the bright, shiny light, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what seems to be an extremely valuable opportunity or someone who's really valuable to you and he uses a really good example in the book um, with the client thing, but uh, one of the clients that mm -hmm. uh, in the story, but, you know, I just think that this is something that probably a lot of people would f easily, um, you know, fall, fall to this concept, you know? Yeah. One thing I want to point out is I think throughout the book, they almost make it seem like magic, like, oh, you need someone to help you. And then your who is automatically there. Mm -hmm. And although, you know, if you are writing down who you need and what you want done, you can help kind of eliminate probably some choices, but just keep in mind that sometimes it takes a bit to filter through the right people. Like in my mind comes the example, Ashlyn, who used to work on our team, like she is amazing. And when I hired her, I thought she'd be able to do all of these things. Like she can do my marketing, she can do my bookkeeping, she can do everything. Obviously one person cannot do all that, but through that, we found that she is a very strong, she's very strong with numbers and she mm. became the bookkeeper and then actually opened up her own business. So just knowing that like, even if you have a great relationship with somebody, like don't make them try to fit a who position if they're not the right who, I guess right. is kind of my advice because I don't think the book really does a job of showing you well, how they, to I think they, through they, too well. They do, but they, they also kind of hint on it like, um, so I'm not trying to disagree with you, but no, like, it's okay. you know, finding, uh, the who's who are passionate about what they're doing. True. Right. So, yeah. you know, a thing we talked about earlier in the book, you know, you may not like gardening when we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, what was it? Uh, procrastination as wisdom. Like if you don't like mowing your yard, mm -hmm. you find someone who is someone out there absolutely loves gardening. Right. So I think it, it kind of hints, it doesn't really address it directly. True. But uh, kind of in a roundabout way. I think for me, it's just, uh, I'm not a super confrontational person. So if I'm really excited about somebody, then it's hard for me to approach them and be like, mm, this actually isn't working out. But you mm -hmm. have to find a way to, to do that and filter through people and find really what they're good at. Yeah. And I was actually thinking about this in the shower. I'm not trying to drag this episode out no. too much. But I was thinking about this, uh, I think it was maybe in the next chapter, or one of the final chapters, they were talking about finding the right who's and all that stuff. And I was trying to relate. I was trying to think about my own personal experiences mm -hmm. and the things that I, the thing that really popped to my mind was in the military, obviously it's a, I'm very team oriented. I, I fit, I love the concept. I love building teams. Mm -hmm. I love being able to utilize teams. And the great thing about these concepts in this book is you get to build, you get to pick and choose your who's who are the best people at whatever it is you need to do as you grow your business or you grow whatever, whatever, um, that you're you know trying to accomplish mm -hmm. in the military. Most of the time, you know, like I would inherit teams that I did. I didn't have any hand yeah. in building. Yes. Um, but you would obviously have a, a task that you would have to accomplish. Like, I don't know, build a training site or whatever, you know, construction type stuff. And a lot of time about it's, um, being able to see, find the strengths in those who's right. Everybody has their own skill sets, and then even though some people were delegated to do certain things, they mm -hmm. might not be very good at it. So mm -hmm. being a good leader is yes. being able to identify people's strengths and weaknesses. So even if you don't have the the hand-picked who's who are, like, extraordinarily good at one thing, is sometimes if you have a team, you know, for those people out here, find yourself in this situation, it's about finding the strengths and weaknesses of those people who are working under you, right? Mm -hmm. So... And that's a theme in the book is he talks about like being someone's hero. Mm -hmm. And I interpret it like that is you're helping somebody else identify what their strengths are because maybe they don't know yet. So that's you're being a hero to them. So I totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and in this chapter, he gives the example of Kate, who's an entrepreneur. And I can really relate to a lot of what um, she is, was kind of going through. Basically, she's trying to build a business and she gets herself. Well, she has endometriosis, but because she's working so hard and stressed out, like she basically ends herself up in the hospital and blah, blah, blah. And through that and through the time she has in the hospital, she takes that time to reflect and it's just like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Like, do I need to be stressed? Well, I hope you haven't worked yourself into the no. hospital, but <laughs> no, no, no. as I was, as I was going over this, I was thinking of you, right? <laughs> well, you know, like, you know over the last couple of years of getting to know you, yeah. as I can see where, <laughs> yeah, well, you, just, you love to take on all of this right. weight and yeah. you know, it's, it's all about delegating out to the right who's. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And I loved the questions that she asked herself. So when she's in the hospital, when she's recovering, she's trying to help herself figure out where does she want to go next? So she's asking herself, what does she actually want? Um, who does she want to be? 
what was she no longer willing to do and what was going to be different about how she approached things in the future. So again, you can read the whole story in the book, but basically she ends up forming a company that helps entrepreneurs figure this out and start to delegate. Yeah, she designed it around what the, the, she problem, the same problems she had. Mm-hmm. So that was really, really creative of her to do that. Yeah, and one of the key elements is that she started to say no to things. And there was actually a process, an approval process, if you will, of being able to actually talk to Kate, the owner. So instead of just answering Mm -hmm. all emails, all calls that she was getting, it was uh, her assistant would filter through and whether it was worthy, if that's the right word, of Kate to answer this or if it could be answered by somebody else. So she designed in in her, um, gosh, why can't I think of the word, like her model Mm -hmm. for the business. Mm -hmm. She basically created buffers in it. So everything was vetted before it took her time away from her. So all of her who's that worked for her, you know, by the time it got to her, that was usually the most valuable information or interaction that she had to actually partake in as opposed to just getting bombarded Mm -hmm. with everything else. Yeah. And it seemed like they developed a lot of training tools and just information too, that was easily accessible, like on websites or wherever they kept it, that they could refer people to rather than just answering everybody's individual questions. Like go to our page of resources and find that information. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So I found that really valuable because by being able to do that, she was now actually having meaningful relationships with people she wanted to rather than everyone else just um, basically distracting her from who she wanted to spend her time with. Yeah. So. And there's a quote, I don't know if it's a quote in the book or if it was just written in there, but you know, the, the, they said that, you know, some of the, the, one of the best attributes of a leader is the ability to say no. Mm-hmm. Right. So she just basically designed all of those filters into the business, which is pretty neat. It was neat. And it's not like she's just ignoring these people that have questions and have needs. She's just found a way for her not to be the person that deals with all of them and answers all of them. Matter of fact, we have the quote right here in the, in the show mm-hmm. notes from uh, Derek, is it Sivers or Sievers? Yeah. And I don't know who that is. It says, but. yeah. I, and I, I, that one did catch, catch me when I was reading it the first time. It was pretty funny. Mm-hmm. It says, uh, when deciding whether to do something, if you feel anything less than wow, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Then say no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you just have to pick and choose. And, and, you know, people have to understand that, yeah, you can't say yes to everything. So, yep. Your bandwidth is only so big. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. I agree. Um, so, then another thing they talked about in this chapter, what I actually found really funny because I don't really know if I agree with the analogy they're using, but it was always be the buyer. And from, I, it was that concept was a little hard to grasp, but I think from, especially from the real estate world, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So um, they, I think it highly depends on what you're doing, but yes. at the same time, I, I can see where he's, where he's trying to go with it. Right. Yeah. The, the analogy they use is like, always be the buyer because the buyer has the power to say no where the seller doesn't. And I was like, hmm, not in my world <laughs> <laughs> because in real estate, when my buyers are, you know, giving offers to sellers. Sellers say no all the time. Mm -hmm. But the whole point was that in this example, the buyer has the power to decide if something is worth their time, not the seller is what they were trying to say. So just be the person that gets to, gets to say no is, is basically, I think what he was trying to say. Yeah. And, um, I don't know if we haven't heard the example of the, well, the, it was like the investment firm or whatever, where mm-hmm. the guy, they, they had the really valuable client. Yes. I didn't put it in here, but that is one. In yeah, that was, yeah. I think that, mm-hmm. yeah, that was the example he was using with this about, you know, be the buyer. Yeah. So the guy ran an investment company or whatever, had a, a really, really high dollar uh, client who was going to bring a lot of value to the company. And then um, after he met with um, the guy, the investor or whatever it was several times, he was very negative, condescending, you know, uh, constantly ab- abrasive. Mm-hmm. And that was his one-on-one meetings with him. And then when he met with his staff or, you know, his who's that were working in the company, he abused them too. So after, even though that guy was bringing him tons of value, um, and it was going to really help the company out. He had to make the decision in the end that, you know, as the buyer that, um, even though it was going to bring him a lot of money, he had to say no to that client. And then of course the client was like, what do you mean? No. Like, you know, he, the guy was obviously so wealthy. He wasn't used to being yes. turned, turned down yes. for anything, mm-hmm. but in the interest of all of his who's that he had working for him, all of his employees, it was not worth the, the, 
the pain in the butt yes. to, to take on this client. So he had to tell him no. So that's the aspect of being the buyer and not, not the, or being the, taking the stance of the buyer because you can say no. Yes. If you don't like the deal. Yes. One thing I like about that story too, is that even though his who's were being treated that way, they were all willing to back up. Uh, I don't know what his name was, but they're all willing to back him up and take on this client if that's what he wanted, because he was such a great leader that they were like, you know, if you think this is best for the company and for us, we'll do it, even though this guy is being a jerk. So I thought that was kind of neat, too. Like they had his loyalty no matter what his decision was. But ultimately, he decided, I don't want my people to be treated like this. Yeah. And then kind of a side note on the same story, but and he highlights it in the book a little bit, too, is like immediate feedback on that, too. So if you have if you have a team or whatever you're leading, um, you know, support immediate feedback from mm -hmm. them. So if stuff is going back, because a lot of times as leaders, especially if you're a high, high level leader in an organization, you do not see what's going on in the weeds. And if you yes. don't get that feedback, there can be a lot of negativity going on and you're not aware of it. So you have to embrace the, the feedback from the entire organization. And you have to ask for it directly. I think he mentions that too of like, a lot of subordinates aren't going to feel comfortable oh, just no. coming yeah. and giving feedback. Even if you say, my door is open, come anytime, they're not going to feel comfortable <laughs> yeah. coming in. You literally have to ask them, yeah. like an AAR, tell me what went right, tell me what went wrong, what can I do better? So, All right, and then in Chapter 9, he talks about how to be effective collaborators, which, again, just another great point. I think a lot of us feel that we need to do things on our own, um, either – I don't know. We, we think we don't work well with others. We want to take all the credit, whatever it is. But the whole point and who not how is you have to collaborate and have mm -hmm. people do what they're best at. Otherwise, you can't reach your full potential. Yeah, you'll never grow whatever, you know, if, again, use it from the, the business aspect of it. You're never going to continue to grow if you're taking on, you know, a majority of the tasks yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to delegate. You know, they, they point out the fact that some of the highest achievers like they cannot delegate at yes. all. You know, they have to take on the task because they have to be in control and that's counterproductive to growth. You have to be able to, to get people to help you. Yes. And they, in this chapter, he gives the example of the golfer tiger, mm -hmm. um, tiger woods and how his caddy was instrumental in him winning all the, the, um, yeah. championships that he won. I didn't know that. I mean, I obviously I knew but... like the, the caddy is extremely important in like mm -hmm. professional golf, but I didn't know the story of, I guess, uh, um, Tiger had a tendency to overshoot all the time. And his caddy collaborating with him knew that. He knew Tiger very well. And I guess even during the several year, five, six, seven years that Tiger was most successful, mm -hmm. his caddy knew that he always tended to overshot. So for years and years and years, his caddy would always purposely tell him that it like the shot was like 20 30 yards under what it was because mm -hmm. he knew that tiger woods was going to hit it longer yes so that i thought that was pretty cool i thought that was a really cool story too uh and something they emphasize in this chapter too is that you don't have to have all the answers and i think that's a lot of times why people are afraid to collaborate because they think they have to know Be this yeah. i absolutely love this point and i i try i, I verbalize this to people as much as i humanly can you're not the smartest person in the mm -hmm. room. Part of being successful is understanding that you have to find the smartest people who are whatever it is they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, and he gives the example of Ford, who, you know, in the 1920s or whenever he was developing all of his cars, he would have people that, I don't know, just wanted to basically, I think, ruin his reputation or whatever they were trying to do. But they would ask him, all, like, he had one interview where they were asking him questions, like historical questions. Yeah, like, this was in Think and Grow Rich. Oh, yeah. This story was from example. Napoleon mm -hmm. Hill's uh, yeah. Think and Grow Rich. And so he was being interviewed. Yes. And, and they were asking him stupid questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, But basically, he just said, like, I have at the touch of a button, I can bring anyone in to answer your question. Like, I don't need to know all of it. You know, I just. Yeah. He was the master of utilizing people yeah. for their strengths. Yeah. And yeah, all, all I have to say is that <laughs> if you are the smartest person, like. First of all, you're not. So like there's always stuff that you don't know and, and people just need to humble themselves about mm -hmm. that, you know? So yeah, I, that's all I, have to say. I may not always be the best at it if anybody's hearing this and mm -hmm. me personally, but I, I try to live by that. I do try to utilize this strategy quite a bit Yeah, and, and probably leaning on again. I don't 
being keep drink bringing up the military all the time but yeah that was one of the things i was taught you know is you know you may not know everything but you got to find the right people mm -hmm. who do mm -hmm. yeah um plus i think it just helps like bring in experts that know you know, if you're trying to impress a client or whatever it is, bring those experts in to tell them, like, for instance, when we do a listing appointment, we always bring in Colleen, who is an agent on our team, but she's our stager because mm -hmm. she knows better about staging. I don't know anything so, about design. Yeah. When I'm walking through a property, I'm not going to give that advice. I need Colleen there because she is the expert of, you know, utilizing space. Staging photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Pulling the guys who know how to do the photos. Yeah, and they're, they're using, exactly. For us, they're amazing. Too many selfless agents. plug too many agents that take their own photos yeah icons. really bad one <laughs> um a, another thing i was mm -hmm. um on this point i was watching another youtube video and the same thing with us like we knew that we weren't going to be like experts at editing these videos mm -hmm. so you went out and fought found found someone he did and then one of the examples i saw this morning the guy had created a, his own youtube channel and he did the same thing. He recognized the fact that he, he doesn't know how to do the editing. He doesn't know how to do all the behind the mm -hmm. scenes things that comes up with the, with the creating a YouTube channel. So he yes. went out and found the people who do know how to do it. That's a great example. And even just for me, you know, I hadn't read this book and maybe didn't think about it in that context. But what I was thinking about was, could I teach myself to edit videos? Probably. Yeah. But how long That's would the point. it take yes. me to do that? And why would I waste my time on something that I don't know proficiently when I know real estate proficiently. Yeah. That's that's oh. another point that the guy made. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I could spend 20, 20 or tens or hundreds of an hours trying to, hundreds of hours mm -hmm. trying to do this, mm -hmm. right? How much value are you losing by doing that? Again, back to a point that we talk about quite a lot, especially being real estate agents and people trying to sell their houses on their own. Yes. Right? You know, they don't want to pay the couple thousand dollars or whatever it may be to hire someone to do photo or, you know, a real estate agent mm -hmm. or photos. But think of, you know, in the asp in the example of trying to spend hundreds of hours to learn how to edit, like if you have something that's much more valuable with your time, like how much, how much are you losing over the couple thousand dollars? that yeah. you would, you know, have to pay somebody to do yes. it. Yep. I totally agree. Hundreds of hours could be very valuable to some people. Mm -hmm. So another point he brings up in here is applying the 80% rule, which we talk about all the time. But basically he says, bring a project, whatever it is to an 80% solution and then run with it. Like it is getting to 80% of something being done is the easiest part and then trying to get 80 to 90 and then 90 to 100 takes way more time than it ever did to get to 80. And most of the time at 80, it's probably good enough because a, a project, whatever it is, is never going to be 100%. There's always something that you could probably do better, tweak a little bit, et cetera. They give an example of, I think he gave a quote about art, how like art is never finished. It's just stops at an interesting point. And this yeah, I, I like thought that. was such a great point because if you're, have a perfectionist type personality, then you're going to be somebody who continues to just work and work and work on something and never actually produces anything that has results. So get it to that 80% and then put it out there. You can always start to refine it if you need, et cetera, but don't get caught in the minutia of trying to have it perfect. Get the, get it to the point where it's good enough and just start cranking out results. That's mm -hmm. what you need to do. Yep. Don't get caught up in the finer details of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then he also says, be radically open and honest in your communication. So this was kind of what you already brought up, but mm -hmm. asking for help when you need it and asking for that feedback. It's yeah. so important because if you're not getting that, you're not growing, you're not improving. So Yeah. And it's important that it happens quickly too. Like the immediate feedback, the immediate at like, if, especially if you're stuck in a task or something like that and you're working on a team, mm -hmm. don't hesitate to ask for help. Like, um, actually they, they talk about that in, uh, in the book as well, talking about how uh, we're kind of trained in elementary school and stuff to not ask for help, to take yes. on everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the wrong mentality to have. So he was saying, you know, like <clears throat> in our school system, we're taught to be, uh, to take tests and all other stuff. And if we Don't ask cheat. for help, we're cheating. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think that's kind of ingrained in a lot of us that we're, we're just afraid to ask for help when you shouldn't be, especially if you're on a team, you know, cause think about how much time you're wasting. Especially if someone it's, it's, you could be beating your head against the wall, trying to find an answer to something, and this person to your left or right might have it on hand. Mm -hmm. You know how much time are you wasting if you just don't ask for help? So yes. it's important yes. to to get immediate feedback and ask for help when you need it. Yeah, you're exactly right. 
All right, we're going to move into part four, which is about freedom of purpose. Um, so this, again, he, he's kind of piggybacking off of the idea of collaborating, but he's saying stop competing and start collaborating. And I think this is where he talks about the elementary school where, you know, again, mm-hmm. it's it's not cheating. And, and you also aren't trying to be better than somebody else. You're trying to come together so that you can produce the best result. And in this chapter, he gives the example of a woman who had a grandma who was very vital in civil rights and she wanted to write a book about her but this woman I think she was a doctor and she just could not find the time to write about her grandmother and then she had gotten an email she had written a few chapters gotten an email from a woman who also wanted to write a book about this woman's grandmother and the woman was like oh my god I can't you know let her beat me to the punch etc so felt as though she was competing with her for Mm -hmm. a while and then I, I think she I don't know who she talked to but somebody was like why don't you write this book with her. Why would you compete against each other? Why don't you work together? And so they work together. The woman is obviously able to share all of these, you know, personal anecdotes about her grandmother and they get the book written together rather than yeah. competing. Yeah. I, I, so he, he states in the book that he's not competitive at all mm-hmm. and that he hates competition. You know, yeah. there's a lot of argument to be had there. Yeah. Um, healthy competition is good, but it, when it comes to you holding yourself back mm-hmm. or, you know, like, you know, uh, basically pushing, you know, someone else's head underwater as they're trying to push you underwater. Yes. Right. So it's like, you know, to work, to work together. They, uh, one of the examples that I, I've never been a huge basketball person, but he used the example of mm-hmm. Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal when they're on the same team, two superstars, but instead of working well together, they were constantly competing against each other. It was detrimental to the team's, you know, success. Right. So yeah, when you're, when you're trying to achieve something, it's always better when you're working with somebody else. Yeah. The, the power of, uh, I think they even say, the, they say in the book too, is like individual will always lose to a team who are trying to achieve the same goals. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, so collaboration um, in, in something you're trying to do. As a matter of fact, this book was written in, in the same thing, right? So Exactly. There's definitely a time and a place for competition, 100%. Yeah. And it that can really be a motivation for a lot of people. But like you said, if you're struggling to do something and somebody else has the answer, it just makes sense to collaborate. Yeah, especially if you and the other individual are kind of moving in the same direction. Mm-hmm. You know, why would you not, you know, team up and make things happen? Yeah. Um, yeah, he just talked kind of about how basically there's – you know, sports and stuff aside, but we're talking about the business world. Like there's no reward for doing lots of tasks and working by yourself. Like Mm -hmm. what, what is that going to get you? It's going to get you probably being burnt out and spending, you know, hundreds of hours on things that you're not good at. Yeah. So that you could be using Mm -hmm. much more productively. Yeah. Cool. So then he uh, goes into talking about that. Who's actually expand your vision and your purpose. And he gave the example of J.R.R. Tolkien, and C.S. Lewis, which was, I thought, a really interesting example. I mean, I've read both of their books. I didn't realize they knew each other. But basically, they were very yeah. instrumental in helping each other write their books. Um, J.R. Tolkien helped C.S. Lewis actually find his faith again. You know, he wrote the Narnia books, all that, that are all very faith-based. Um, and in turn, you know, C.S. Lewis did the same thing for Tolkien as far as inspiring him and encouraging him to write the books that he wrote. Yeah, for sure. And I'm a huge Tolkien fan and I like Lewis a lot too. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know about the story at all. I, yeah. I didn't know they were friends. It was pretty cool because in the book, he, you know, Tolkien had written like a 4,000 paragraph, uh, you know, story about this character and Lewis was able to read it and, and uh, kind of support Tolkien and, and his support is what led him to write, you know, re, uh, basically write the trilogy that mm-hmm. he did. So mm-hmm. It's amazing uh, to see the power of some of those things that happen. Yeah, and I think it's a good example of what we were just talking about with competition, too. There are two people that are working in the same industry. They Mm -hmm. could totally be just competing with each other and keeping ideas to themselves, but instead they you know, were helping each other, and now they're two of the best-known authors in the world in in history. Hundreds of millions of copies sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, A very, like, kind of profound idea that he kind of wraps up the book with is that who's actually become your purpose and you and allow you to be heroes to people. Um, and I think, again, this is kind of a theme that we've seen throughout a lot of the books that we've read. It's a lot of finding your why. And when we read Start With Why, we discovered that it really needs to be 
in service of others. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there's not a lot of meaning behind it. And that's basically what he's saying here too, is that your who's and helping them develop into who's for other people, being who's for other people, like that is our purpose. And and that all goes back to collaboration and helping each other. Yeah, it's it's back to the concept of bringing value to other people, right? Yes. Whether, whatever, ask, you know, whatever that may look like, um, you know, servant leadership, you know, it's not about taking from your subordinates or whatever the people work for you. It's about what can you give them? What can you do for them to make them productive? Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it it may not be necessarily a subordinate. It could be a business partner or someone you work with or whatever, any, any kind of team dynamic that you're in, you should be asking yourself, what can I do for that person to, Mm -hmm. to help make them better? And then you will, you're personally going to be, um, and value is going to increase because of that, not because of what you're taking from them, but what you're giving in return. Exactly. Yeah. So just to kind of reemphasize, because we've said it a few times now, yes, this book is about trying to find who's and people that can assist you, but in turn, you have to realize that you are going to be who's for people as well. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm-hmm. It's not just you finding people to do things for you. You in turn are doing things for people as well. Yeah. And this doesn't have to be related to business either. No. I mean, person, I mean, the, him finding his wife is a perfect example. Mm-hmm. He got, you know, that's his personal relationship, but obviously it relates to a business in the end, but you know, same thing people you surround yourself with people that you you have in your community, everything. It does not, this says it has, this book does not have to do anything with business. Mm-hmm. You can relate this to your day to day life for sure. Yeah. And if you keep that idea in mind and you understand what your purpose is, you're going to understand that no matter what task you're doing is bigger than the task itself. And he gives the example of the story of the bricklayers, which is the Mm. same story that was told in Start With Why, I thought was really interesting, the same parable. Um, But basically, uh, in this parable, he has three different bricklayers. What are you doing? And one of them says, I'm a bricklayer. I'm working hard laying bricks to feed my family. He has another one. He says, I'm a builder. I'm building a wall. And then he has a third one, and that person says, I'm a cathedral builder. I'm building a great cathedral to the Almighty. Yeah, So, and they were all working on the same cathedral. Yes. and obviously the third person has much more vested interest in, mm-hmm. in uh, finishing that job because the first person, you know, they don't have to do that job to earn money. They could do something else, but this third person really feels that vested interest. Yeah, B- a much different perspective of what, w- what they were accomplishing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sweet. Well, I think that kind of takes us to the end of the book. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to address in the book? No, I think this, uh, just kind of recap overall, like I enjoyed the book, uh, yeah. really highly recommend anybody who hasn't picked up a copy or listened to the audio book, mm-hmm. go ahead and do it. I think, um, there's some really valuable concepts in here that again, can relate to your business, your personal growth, your, you know, relationships that you're, you're managing. So, yeah, I, I I would definitely recommend this book to anybody. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't matter what stage of business you're in. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah you could be, you know, a week shy of deciding you're going to start a business. Yeah. And this would yep. be, you know, very useful to you. So. Agreed. Or if you already own a business and you're trying to grow it. So Yeah. And just to kind of bring it all together, just the first action steps that you need to take after reading this book is basically start by setting a goal, whether that's like you said, starting a business, growing your business, whatever it is, but you want to create this new and bigger version of your future that maybe you didn't think was possible, but by bringing in people to help and bringing in your who's, it can grow bigger than you ever imagined. And then you just ask yourself who can help me with this. And it's honestly as simple as that. Even as, even if you're just trying to grow a, a, a wonderful, healthy life and surrounding your people with, with good people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. You want to take us out? Sure. Uh, As always, we really appreciate all the support, all of our viewers. Um, We love bringing value to you. So uh, please bring some value to us by liking and sharing, subscribing to the channel, um, leaving us comments and uh, and a review. Um, Thank you very, everybody that's out there is following us and we hope to keep doing great things. Yep. Absolutely. See you next time. Awesome. See ya.